All right, in terms of today, we'll set out to you some brief key objectives that we hope will be fulfilled throughout the course of the um, demonstration and presentation. Um, and then secondly, we'll step you through what we believe is a practical approach for achieving uh, the design and implementation of a future state operating model with digital parameters. And within that framework, we'll discuss with you and present to you actual illustrations of what we mean by understanding the current state environment within an organization. And then subsequent to that, um, the pillars and components of building a future state operating model for the digital world. Okay, moving on. In terms of today's objectives, there aren't many, but we feel we should share them with you. Number one is in our experience, our practical experience to share with you what the journey from a current state assessment to the design and implementation of a future operating model looks like. Secondly, to share with you what we believe are the, the mission criticals must do's um, in order to have successful achievement of such a design and implementation. And lastly, share some of the brief highlights between the various components of a target operating model. We think this is a reasonable endeavor and we believe we can accomplish this in the time allotted to us. Okay, so we talk about a practical uh, approach for achievement. When we say practical, we mean this is based on our organization's design and implementation of target operating models within um, asset and vehicle finance. And practical in the sense that these the lessons that we will share today are realizable and implementable as opposed to theoretical. So in terms of the various pillars and components of an operating model from conception to implementation, Moving from the left to the right where it says current state, and we've got three pie, uh, slices of a pie there. Um, just briefly, when we mean understand the current state performance, that is all around understanding the quantitative dimensions and the quantitative analysis of an existing organization. So if we take underwriting a loan origination, it's all around understanding the current process times, performance, and productivity through credit decisioning as an example. Secondly, in terms of the next slice of process and technology, current state, in brief terms, this is to get a full immersion of the current state of an organization in terms of how their business processes are applied, both officially and unofficially, and what does the supporting technology look like from a quote to proposal management, to credit decisioning, to um, funding and payout and activation. And then lastly, within the current state, as a result of understanding the current levels of performance and process impediments and technology enablers or disenablers, is to identify and quantify the pain points by which an organization is currently under or under duress. And by doing those three things is the basis and groundwork for putting together a future state target operating model. Once that is achieved to client satisfaction, we would then move into what we would call future state. Future state in terms of building out a sustainable operating model that includes improvements or transformation for current state business processes and the use of enabling technology or transformative technology. Second, is from that building out of an operating model is to identify bottom line cost improvement. So there's no sense in putting, in our experience of putting together a future state operating model unless it's underpinned with quantitative analysis. Saying we should move to some future state operating model because it's the right thing to do is not the basis for doing it. Thirdly, we have found that in certain instances, when an organization is transformed, when they move from a current operating model to a transformative future state model, the structure of the organization, be it numbers of teams, be it self-managed teams, number of management layers, size of staffing for a particular function or department will need to change. And lastly, again, in our experience, the identification of specific benefits, which are interest in value to end customers, be they brokers, 
direct customers or dealers, as well as internal users, is key in all of this. So you can't do any one of these things in isolation, and hence the diagram um, depicts a, a, a fully holistic view. All right, so we've mentioned multiple times in the previous slide, understanding the current state. And, then, and if you recall, we talked about current state performance. Well, what does that mean in real terms? It's not just somebody telling you, well, our performance is in line with industry standards. So if we take as an example, underwriting decisions, and for, let's say, as a key metric, and this will be known to anybody who deals with underwriting credit decision and loan origination, that the number and percentage of approvals um, within a finance company, be it subprime, complex prime, or standard prime, is quite key as a metric of efficiency and performance. And in this particular instance, our, our lesson learned and what we want to share with you is that in order to establish some baseline level of performance that's quantitative in nature, is you must get representative um, statistical norms and historical periods. In this case, if you look at the the bottom of the of the graphic, you will see May 2015 to January 2018 and beyond. So we have a three and a half year representation of underwriting performance as measured by approval rates. Um, and the imperative here in this illustration is that we merely don't want to reduce the trend by seven and a half percent. We want to improve throughput as measured by an increase, not only in the number of applications approved, but obviously the percentage. Following on from that, and again, sticking with the underwriting credit decisioning and credit analyst perspective, um, the imperative here in, in, a, in, in a current, in the future state, is based on the current level of productivity as measured by where it says monthly average 4.68 applications process per hour. If we don't have these metrics from which to base future operating model improvement on, then we have nothing. We have conjecture and supposition. We don't have transformation. Um, again, what we've done, uh, gone back to is a historical perspective. Um, calculated the statistical norms, which are represented by the average, and, dem and, and then calculated a, a trend. Okay, all of this will help shape what future improvement will look like from which to base any type of cost improvement against. Okay, moving on. So in the previous slide, we talked about performance and productivity, but in any operating model, there needs to be a various analysis and putting forward of omni-channel, again in our experience, multi-channel if you will. So what we needed to do and what we suggest doing is understand how applications in this instance are being funneled through the various channels available to dealers and customers. In this particular instance, there are four channels that are available within the current state operating model. There's a dealer portal which dealers can log in and actually put business through in terms of applications, credit decisions, and payout. Um, and this is based on a customer walking into a particular automotive dealership and placing business. Um, there's also a customer direct portal where a customer can self-serve the obtaining of multiple quotes and uh, to go so far as uh, having a credit decision rendered. There's also the 1990s version of technology whereby a dealer can submit fax-based applications into a head office, which in our experience then results in extensive keen by underwriters and not actually underwriting proposals. And lastly, again, a, a little bit of dated technology or distribution channel, a dealer can phone in a particular uh, proposal to an underwriter or a, I'll call it a data entry person. And again, um, render a significant amount of keying into a system or, shall I say, a spreadsheet. So the imperative here is to, is to drive business through different channels, is to increase the use of a dealer portal, which then reduces operating costs for the finance company, and to allow customers to self-serve um, the provision of quotes and credit decisionings within the confines of their home or at their leisure and not drive them into a dealership necessarily. And on the bottom elements of the slides is to start reducing 
facts-based applications and moving cust moving dealers into a more self-service use of an internet portal and also to reduce the number of inbound telephone applications which quite frankly tie up an underwriter or, or credit analyst with data entry as opposed to doing what they were hired to do which is to make credit decisions okay so in the previous slides we've seen a quantitative analysis of distribution channels um, and their trends and their average performance and their best demonstrated performance and how long things take to do now. So it's very clear that is a current state that is not based on conjecture, supposition, or innuendo. It is based on quantitative analysis. Staying within the theme of current state and we'll call these pain points. So we have provided for you a level two or a level three process diagram. For those on the call, we could probably argue and debate for the next two or three days, well, that's really a level one or it's a level two or a level four. But the illustrative nature here is to show you that in order to understand current state before we move into a future state is to understand both the official processes as represented by this flow chart and the unofficial unseen processes that are not in an operating procedure. Um, what you see here is, with the various numbers will become apparent in the next few slides. And when we mean pain points, it's not for us to sit across from an end user or a manager of a loan origination department or uh, a dealer services or a manufacturer services department and ask he or her to please vomit up a litany of pain points and thank you very much and that's an analysis and that's a study that will not suffice so we take these process flow charts and we have found in our experience the best way to validate this is not by sitting and asking users it's by job shadowing which is nothing new but we have found getting representative job shadowing actually will either validate what you see on screen or invalidate through the surfacing of unofficial processes. We will also capture process times, which will help with future cost improvement calculations. Okay, and staying with the theme of this job shadowing, if for instance, um, as this demonstrate or depicts, an organization has a multiple branch location that is providing dealer financing or customer financing in branches across let's say the 49 of the 50 continental United States, then we would suggest, and we have done so here, that it is advisable to get the various process times and the pain points from a representative sampling of branches or locations across the United States. That should be determined before the study starts. And as you can clearly see, there is a large delta between what we have depicted as a best demonstrated level of performance, which is the number of minutes it takes to verify contract documentation and trigger a payout to a dealer, versus um, in location 14, close to one hour to do the same process, but obviously um, with different constraints and maybe with some unofficial processes creeping into what they're doing. And here we've just summarized the quantitative dimensions and we've listed some of the things that we have observed. And again, the reason for this dimension is to move away from supposition and innuendo. So moving on. In a few slides previous, we highlighted that there were numbers associated with that process flow. The numbers correlate to pain points. And these are real examples of what we have observed with certain subprime um, uh, clients that we have worked with. Um, I'll call out the pain point where we had seen from a current state perspective, an outbound communication to a customer literally was um, when they were told or they were informed that their credit decision was pending and they were told in an email to please phone this particular organization to discuss the credit application. They weren't told it was approved or referred or declined. They just told the customer the journey will end here, my friends, and you will be instructed, should you so desire, to phone our underwriting department. So what does that mean in terms of the impact um, internally to users and externally, in this case, to a, a potential customer, a new experienced customer? The message 
in our estimation, and we heard and saw this, was that there really was no message. It was confusing. It drove uncertainty in the customer's mind. Am I approved? Am I declined? And it now drives inbound calls, as a significant increase, and the cost as a result. And from a customer experience, first time out of the box with this finance company, there was no customer intimacy. There was a directive, phone us now if you'd like to progress your application. We can't tell you if you qualify for financing until we talk to you. And then setting that scene, what would the future look like? Well, we would say there should be some form of enhanced language capability, whether it's through any form of digital channel. We can tell a customer through SMS, email, or dare I say they could register um, in terms of a one-time log on into a portal, and they could be told what to do next and have a choice of going to a dealership, continuing on with an online application, or going into or phoning a call center, but not be told, phone us now, and there's nothing further in terms of your journey. Okay, we're not gonna cover the six or seven points that we covered um, within the flowchart, but just as another illustration, we said there was a, a very, very high level pain point around the current state providing for a poor customer and dealer experience, and the journey wasn't transparent. Um, so here's a real, illustration. We saw, heard, and witnessed a customer who had been, who thought they had been approved for financing. They were directed to go to a specific dealership, to a specific state in the United States. And when they arrived in the dealership, lo and behold, the dealer told them they have no agreement with that particular finance company. And they're sorry, they will have to put them through the entire credit process again taking all of those details with the customer now sitting in front of them to render a credit decision. Uh, needless to say, that was a very poor customer experience and it probably increased reputational risk. The dealer was confused about what to do next, so was the customer, and we were left thinking, well, who actually owns the customer at, at this point? And we couldn't discern that. Finance company, dealer, broker, don't know. So from that basis, a future state operating model should cater for customers being clearly communicated, obviously have uh, the dealerships and the finance company actually having an agreement, and to enable the customer to decide, do they want to go into a dealership of their choice within X miles from their home or their office? Would they like a callback? Would they like to progress the application online? and clearly tell them the integration points between what is the dealer responsible for, what is the finance company responsible for, and what are they, the customer, responsible for throughout the life of the journey. Okay, so you've seen a, a fairly quick sprint through some of the ways and means that we get under the skin of the current state. Again, I'll just stress the point, it's a combination of quantitative and qualitative analysis from which to build on a future state operating model. Because if you're going to eradicate pain points in a future state, they have to be certain and qualified. And if we're not addressing those, then there is no point in doing this. So looking forward in terms of the design of a digital operating model, um, we put forward four pillars. Um, no doubt there are more, but they're not, in our experience, 50 pillars from which to build an operating model on. And the pillars and the results of doing these things, they must be tangible and they must result in realizable opportunities. First, and, and again, pardon the language, but the first one, implementable strategy and direction is what we would euphemistically call motherhood and apple pie. Everybody would not debate that some form of strategic intent, direction, documentation that drives what are we going to do and execute goals and objectives wise, future orientation wise, and no one's going to debate that it's a good idea. It is needed as the grounding principles to drive an operating model forward. Secondly, we, we call it trans, transformative technology, that you do need to have some type of transformational technology in order to enable a future state. 
It's not reinventing the current technology to support underlying poorly designed business processes, but it must be future oriented and not for the sake of having future oriented technology, it must drive improvement. And moving over to the left side of the slide, again, another motherhood and apple pie statement, but again, in our experience, that future state business processes must reconcile to the technology stack. They cannot be independent of it. Clearly, that will result in suboptimal processes and suboptimal use of the technology. And lastly, as we mentioned in the introductory slides, there might be instances where the building out of a future state operating model might result in wholesale changes to the organizational structure. And as I said earlier, be it levels, be it self-managed teams, be it hours of working, hours of operation, number of management layers uh, and staff layers. So what we'll do now is we'll cover, again, we'll just share with you some of the summary of what we call the, the must-dos for success. And as we said earlier um, in the introduction, there are more slides rather than what's being depicted, which you will have a copy of after the, after the webinar. So from a strategy and direction standpoint, again, it makes sense. A strategy must be implementable. It really cannot be theoretical. It must reference some form of customer preference. It must drive improvements in cost, revenue, gross margin, share of wallet, customer experience, so on and so forth. If it is not implementable and realizable and we have a theoretical depiction of a strategy, we most likely have a 150 page bound, very interesting document, but one that cannot be used to drive strategy. Um, following on, and obviously it needs to reconcile to the organizational goals, it must demonstrate how the art of the possible can be achieved, but it can't paint a picture at a thousand feet. And as I said earlier, it needs to, it needs to, it needs to provide a basis for improvements across a wide variety and dimension of goals, as it's depicted on the slide, revenue, cost, user satisfaction, increased levels of take on for customer, broker, and dealer self-service as an example. Okay, from a technology standpoint, um, some of the key must-dos or mission critical must-dos is that it must directly link to the strategy. It must be able to, to reconcile to how is the strategy going to be implemented through the use of technology, whether it's workflow, whether it's full-blown automation, whether it's artificial intelligence. Whatever the technology stack is, it cannot be independent of strategy. Um, what we have found is that um, clearly going forward, the use of digital strategies, if you will, self-service, customer, broker, dealer, will be imperative. It should include some elements of innovation, let's say artificial intelligence, if you will, but only because it's required, and as the slide says, it's the right thing to do. It shouldn't be that the technology is unbelievably clever, and as we've said here, is looking for a home to fix a problem because that will result in no technology improvement. Um, it should also drive the digital relationship management that, and again, what we mean here is the customer or should be given a choice of channels to progress their application, be it just simply a quote or a credit decision through to pay out an activation of, of a contract. The customer should not be driven down a very narrow channel in our experience. And lastly, it shouldn't be based on somebody spinning up a list of user stories or 1,200 requirements in terms of a new system, and then a new system is built, is built on those requirements. The requirements, in our experience, are nothing more than a set of guidelines, and independently, on their own, don't drive a future state operating model. Okay. So in terms of some practical examples of future state enablers, so we, we talked about what the strategy should contain, and we talked about an example of um, the technology. We, we haven't covered some of the other pillars, again, only because of time. 
So what we'll now do is get one level lower and talk about some of the key enablers within the journey between um, an OEM or a manufacturer, a dealer, and then the various functions and roles that they play in the life cycle from, from quote to activation and payout into some form of back office contract management system. So as an illustration, let's take loan origination, loan processing, credit decisioning. Um, yes, these are at a fairly high level, but you will soon see in future slides their applicability. So again, these aren't detailed requirements. These are, I'll call them aspirational levers to pull in a future state operating model. So for instance, full-blown business process automation using workflow. Historically, as you can, as if you recall from the slides around the levels of performance and productivity, it was 57% ap uh, applications credit decisions. Well, future state models should call for an increase in auto approvals, but not 99% auto approvals, and potentially the use of super declines in terms of automated declines, which will then if that happens, that will then free up the underwriters and the credit analysts to do more of what they were hired to do in the first place, which is to render their professional experience and capability on those credit decisions that require a referred decision or a manual decision. Furthermore, it's the use of technology to invoke um, pre and post uh, credit reference agency policy rules and again, to drive this down the road of automation and perhaps an increase in auto declines. Um, following on from that is the use, what we would call stipulations or underwriting conditions that automatically open and close for the underwriter to do this various forms of checking. And it allows underwriters to, let's, let's say, or the, the finance company to self-serve and maintain their own policy rules as, to po as opposed to relying on a technology vendor that every time the technology vendor wakes up in the morning and sneezes, he or she is sending the client an invoice for updating the policy rules. So the message here is configuration needs to be up front and center with any technology transformation for, let's say, excuse me, an underwriting domain. Um, and then further auto, further automation for populating adverse action letters and standard templated letters which is nothing new, but oftentimes organizations tend to overlook the document management element. And then lastly, and again in keeping with, with the digital theme, is a, a, a key enabler must be that a, a dealer or a broker must be offered upfront when they sign the dealer agreement a choice of communication, such as automated emails to inform them of the results of credit decisioning, um, secure email, or there should we say an increased use of the dealer portal to go in and review what has been approved in a, in a work queue. And as a result of giving them their choice, it should, in practice, reduce the number of inbound calls that the dealer is constantly following up with underwriters in terms of what is my credit decision. Okay, obviously this is not everything in terms of key enablers within um, loan processing and underwriting, but we just wanted to share with you some high-level examples of what should help drive a future state operating model. And then moving on to what we call verification and payout, or in the United States, I believe it's funding. And again, from a digital processing perspective and the new world order moving forward is the use of e-signature, um, it's, it's not new technology, but it, it definitely has a time and a place for the verification and funding activity and the use of digital processing modules um, with various third parties. Um, dealer self-billing is another lever for certain dealers that let's say qualify for self-billing of invoice and, and invoice submission. The use of um, electronic document management solutions as opposed to paper verification of let's say 20 or 30 different loan agreements and supporting documents that have to be validated at payout time. For those um, organizations that continue to use barcoding and OCR technology, we would suggest that they're embedded within the overall 
um, electronic document management solution whereby any documents or images that have been received into a system of record that cannot be automatically matched through OCR technology are routed to an exception queue through workflow. And then the automated opening and closing of conditions or stipulations. And I guess the key message here is, should this be adopted within a future operating model, these need to be configurable and owned and maintained by clients so that the technology vendor does not, again, render an invoice the size of a phone number every time you want to change a policy rule. Right, so we've, in summary, we've talked about a few components within the, let's call it the life cycle from quote to activation. Now it is time to choose, I'll say with a high degree of certainty, of which components to underpin the operating model. So on the left side of the page, you see a variety of modules. And I guess the message here is, it's not just a rush to judgment and pick a gazillion components because I'll have that from menu A and menu C in column D. It's the message is, it's as I said, it's up on the slide. It's not everything, anything. You need, you need to pick the right modules to help underpin the strategy and the technology and the business processes. And again, they must support the strategy. They must drive towards a, a positive customer experience. They should be future-proofing in nature and not historical looking. Uh, they must contribute in certain cases to the filling of regulatory requirements. GDBR is a European regulatory requirement that is mandatory. And in certain instances, a client might not want a piece of technology or a technology solution, but if you fall afoul in the UK and in Europe of regulators, you're facing a fine of, and for this particular instance, of 4% of your annual revenue, and you're on the front pages of all the financial newspapers for the, all the wrong reasons. Um, and lastly, and perhaps most importantly, picking the right technology stack must ensure that you're not using three or four or five years to actually get on with it. Because if it's taking three or four or five years to get on with it, you're doing the wrong thing. And as a result of picking the right components, you then are in a position to actually build the technology. In this instance, the message here is the right technology components will help drive the model and the user experience. In this illustration, the user experience can be summed up that you can quote, you can, gen you can, you can put forward a quote and get a credit decision on various forms of mobile technology. In, K, in, in one instance, a laptop, in one instance, um, a tablet, and in one instance, a mobile phone. So the message here is multi-channel, if you will. Okay, so you've seen some of the sexy bit of, okay, I'll have that in a future state operating model. Um, however, we had, you had seen previously a business process, level two, level three, that looked fairly convoluted, that looked painful. Well, part of the future state operating model is around a redesign of a future state business process. I'm not going to uh, run through all the decision trees and what's here, but if you, upon reflection, review this diagram versus the pain points, you should be able to clearly reconcile that this diagram and this future way of working from a business process standpoint should, should reconcile and eradicate upon implementation the pain points that were previously presented. Okay, so wow, that's a lot of numbers from a spreadsheet. The reason for that is if you're going to put forward an operating model, where there's a quantitative dimension to it, where, you, where your organization is going to be asked to approve a capital expenditure case or an operating expenditure business case, you must have metrics to support those assertions. And the metrics mean that you must provide the as-is assessment in terms of volume should take times and headcount and a future state headcount and cost improvement. And if you look all the way to the very bottom of the screen, there is some form of cost improvement that has been calculated out, and it's not through asking people, does that look like the right number? It's through formal analysis of each step of a business process and how much improvement will be garnered annually as a result of transforming 
the constituent elements of the business process and the business process in aggregate. And I guess the, the message here is that these numbers and the ROI must be real and measurable, hence why you see so much quantitative analysis up on the screen. And behind that analysis is a set, not of assumptions necessarily, but supporting narrative and evidence, empirical evidence to support where did those numbers come from? Because in our experience, if you are presenting to a senior management team, a board of directors, and asking for money in terms of a, of a CapEx case to go make that operating model a reality, and you are questioned around the numbers, and if your response or someone's response is, you know, I'm not sure where the numbers come, came from, but I'll take that away and come back to you, most likely the response from the other side of the desk will be, don't worry, you don't have to come back, and you don't have to come, and you don't have to come back to me ever. Okay, so just some sample illustrations of what would be represented in the operating model itself, and then you will see how it gets put together. And again, it's not everything um, that we're going to cover here this afternoon. But just as an illustration from a dealer originations in terms of quote and proposals that the, the future state operating model should cater for these various components that are up here. So I'll, I'll just pick one, the second one, we call it a hard stop. Um, in, the, in the future operating model, if a dealer cannot actually quote for certain plans, packages, value-added products, which we call gaps, terms, rates, commissions, subvention, the dealer would be stopped at, at actually trying to quote this and get all the way to the, the standpoint of then telling the customer 10 minutes into the application, you know, I'm sorry, that plan and package is not on offer. Um, the operating model, future state, should also cater for the use of third-party web services or APIs to third parties that are out there in the public domain, like Nexus, OFAC, AML, for identity checks, credit checks, so on and so forth, and should also allow for real-time tracking of application status. Why is that important? Well, that's important because in the future, a dealer should be prompted to use their portal and the technology that they and the finance company are providing for them to go in and look at a work queue and, and immediately see the status and not have to phone the underwriting department every half an hour, God forbid, or 10 minutes and ask about the status of a referred proposal or phone the funding department and ask, when is my um, deal going to get funded and into my account? Um, additionally, this should allow for omni-channel communication. So if a, dealer, if a dealer chooses to use SMS text to get feedback on their, on their proposal or the credit decision, or they want automated email, they can have it at their choice. But it's not automated email and SMS text messages every time somebody wants to communicate. And from a workflow perspective, again, in the context of a future state operating model, um, the, the model must cater for multiple workflows to include service level agreements that are tracked in real time. They can be tracked by asset type, customer type. It can be a, a retail customer. It can be a commercial customer. And it can be by channel. You can have different SLAs through enable through workflows, whether you're a dealer, broker, or direct customer. And again, real time reporting. And as we said earlier, full blown business process automation um, that actually triggers automated emails, secure um, and SMS text to communicate with dealers, giving the customers and the dealers their choice. Um, moving further down the page, the workflow underpins everything. It, it tracks interactions between various functions and let's call them end users being customers and dealers. The workflow will govern approvals and formal authorization, authorizations and will drive uh, business and policy rules and can be used to automate tracking points so you can actually track process time between various interactions within the end-to-end -end process. So how does that all come together? It comes together in, in a very busy slide with a lot of content and all this is meant to do is to say the summation of what you've seen previously around putting together the future state can be represented 
in a what we would euphemistically call an operating on a page operating model on a page within this model it's functionally rich it talks about the desires for future states uh, distribution channels what we want to do with end customers um, quantitative analysis around increase in auto approvals declines loan to book values so on and so forth and then presents the key levers that can be used and how the future operating model will impact the dealer, the manufacturer, the customer, and potentially staff. Okay, there's a fair amount uh, to cover on this, but again, we're going to leave this with you um, for reflection after this um, demonstration. And then to sum it all up, there needs to be, as we said earlier in the, in the presentation, that there needs to be some form of benefits that have to be called out when putting forward an operating model in the, in the digital world. And there must be benefits that can be clearly articulated in terms of the customer, the dealer, the broker, the manufacturer. And they should be able to be articulated by within the, ver within the journey. So sales and new business take on, the actual credit decisioning and risk management, and then the payout, activation, and funding. There has to be some benefit in all of this for everyone in the chain. Otherwise, we question why do it. And then lastly, we moving on to changes in the organizational structure and design. We said earlier in the presentation that in certain cases, there will be the need to radically transform or semi-radically transform what the structure looks like, the number of teams, the number of staff, an increase or a decrease as well as new metrics by which their performance will be measured on. There might be less levels of managers. There might be self-managing teams. What we've depicted here is how the building out of an operating model and the measurement that you saw earlier in terms of the improvement will then result in the proper staffing of a particular function or team or department to deliver the operating model results. So we have gone through this quite quickly. We have hopefully given you um, thought, food for thought and consideration um, from the White Clark Group. We thank you for your time. Have a good afternoon and a good evening. Thank you.